Previously on the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Because of you know, the recent Christmas special, it'd be nice to spend a bit more time with um, the First Doctor, Ben and Polly, and uh, see see how offensive the First Doctor is. <laughs> 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 see see whether he's he's at all racist and sexist. So we are going to be reading Ten Little Aliens uh, by Stephen Cole. Uh, hmm. That uh, is, uh, I think it's it's set shortly before the Tenth Planet. Never read it. I know that there is, um, shall we say, an interesting narrative bit in it, which I shall say no more. But I am looking forward to mm. how on earth it's done. Oh, huh. I'm intrigued. Uh, we haven't done a first doctor yet, so that'll no. be, that'll be great. Should be good. Yeah. And now our story continues. Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Mm, mm, sheer poetry, my boy. Happy March. <laughs> <laughs> That's a horrible heart knell, but <laughs> yes. And if if you don't like heart knell, you're in for a you're in for a disappointment this episode. Because <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going to be quite heart knell tastic. How's it going, Chris? Yeah, it's good. It's good. If I sound slightly tired and out of breath, it's because I ran twenty miles this morning along the banks of the Thames, and fortunately, the snowmageddon that Britain's been, I, I use suffering in air quotes and whilst it has caused you know, a lot of problems and stuff I mean it's still if you compare the amount of snow that we have been having in comparison to say Scandinavia or basically any continental European country we, we, we seem to just kind of go ah we can't cope <laughs> yeah the race went ahead and, and it was good and uh, there was little bits of slush but it was nice uh, I wasn't having to run on the Thames which was good just alongside it no uh, no frozen frost fair or anything <laughs> no 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 frost fair but people are skating on the canals in Amsterdam which yeah it's not a frost fair but it's also not something that happens quite so often as it used to it's finally uh, warmed up a little bit in Minnesota here we still have lots of snow on the ground but uh, mm. I'm listening to the uh, patter of freezing rain outside <laughs> <laughs> lovely yeah. <laughs> Fortunately, I don't have to go anywhere today, so that's good. Good, good, good. good. <laughs> a bit of uh, new series news since we mm. last talked. We have a uh, new logo and a new mini intro video for that logo. Yes, it's very exciting. Yeah, we're starting to see glimpses of what will be arriving on our screens in October, I understand. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It looked, it looked fresh. And whilst we don't know much of the 13th Doctor, it just... Yeah, it seemed kind of youthful and it felt kind of invigorated. I mean, not saying that the old logos were tired or anything, but uh, but yeah, it's it's always nice to see a new take on the logo and that new take look good. I liked that the colors were similar to not quite the same as the Russell T Davies era, but it felt like a little bit of a call back in that direction, which was mm. which was nice. If I had one complaint about it, and it wouldn't be the the main logo, but the the secondary logo, and that's the who with the circle around it, mm. reminds me a little bit of the Hunger Games pin. <laughs> <laughs> but other yeah. other than that, no complaints. What do you have uh, for show and tell this month? So so for show and tell this month, uh, I thought I would mention um, something that hasn't actually been released as yet. Who Against Guns, uh, an initiative that has been put together by um, Radio Free Scaro, Verity, uh, Reality Bomb, and other podcasts I'm sure that I can't remember, uh, and also 
potentially Stephen Moffat as well if a fundraising target is met raising money for organisations, you know, charities kind of preventing gun violence in the wake of the horrific shootings in Florida in February. They're doing commentary on the, the war games in many ways is a good fit because because uh, it is a story about about the horrors of violence uh, in, in, in many respects and also there's quite a lot of it uh, so you can have several people doing commentary quite easily without it all just being kind of loads of people piling onto one episode. If you wish to donate to charities outside of America, if you are outside of America, then uh, there are also kind of like nominated ones that you can you can donate to. Um, I, I must say, I always hesitate before kind of like wading into another country's politics. Oh, yeah, it just feels wrong. I mean, I remember I used to live in um, South Carolina and the school near where I lived would in the summer months often have drills for what they would do if there was a shooter and, uh, and I was shocked and that was the best part of 20 years ago and nothing has changed. Mm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get off my high horse, but uh, yeah, it's just... I, don't know, I think um, it's a very unfortunate and tragic incident that happened, and I'm yeah. very glad to to help support the Who Against Guns charity. Mm. I, I, one, it's a great cause, and two, I think mm. it'll be a fun commentary bonus for those who uh, those who donate. So, yeah, excellent. So- do you have something lighter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Good. Uh, my uh, show until this month is about MarsCon, which is the mm. science fiction convention I'm at this weekend, uh, celebrating its 20th anniversary in beautiful Bloomington, Minnesota, right next to the monstrosity that is the Mall of America. <laughs> Yay! They've had um, some fun Who-related guests over the years, uh, mm-hmm. including John Levine, uh, Sergeant Benton. It's a kind of a multimedia convention, so... They've had guests from, you know, Star Trek, various Star Wars, Babylon 5, etc. And it's kind of low-key get-together and I had a fun chat with Kathy Sullivan, who I think I've mentioned on this podcast before. She's an author for Big Finish mm. and got some good uh, book and short story recommendations. So uh, it was a fun weekend when I may or may not attend uh, the final day, depending on the, the weather situation here. <laughs> Fair enough. Cool. Chris, what are we reading this month? So, um, uh, we have been reading Ten Little Aliens by Stephen Cole. Uh, Stephen Cole was, um, for uh, several years, the editor of uh, the BBC range of Doctor Who books. He co-wrote, oh, I can't, I'm blanking on the name now, uh, the book that ended the um, a major Eighth Doctor arc uh, uh, that basically wrapped up all of Lawrence Miles' stuff. In, uh, in one um, possibly overly neat bow. I say that, I've never actually read it, but I've just kind of, I'd, I'd been warned off it. He also wrote a book in which um, the Sixth Doctor and the Brigadier meet Hitler, um, hmm. from memory. Um, and uh, we've already read some Stephen Cole. Yep. We've read his short story that he wrote under the name of Tara Sams. And he was also the editor of the, the main range yes. for, for yeah. some time too. Yes. I think we touched on that last month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This book was originally published in June of 2002 as part of the BBC Books Past Doctor range, mm. and it was republished in 2013 as part of the uh, anniversary year where a novel from each doctor was published. Mm-hmm. And it includes a new introduction from Stephen Cole where he talks about this novel features unreliable narrators, which may be a good thing to know going into it. <laughs> and he also spoils a surprise, at which we will also spoil when we talk about it. So uh, if, as you hear, as uh, you think oh i'd quite like to sort of read this then by all means get it just i would say don't read the foreword of the 50th anniversary edition yeah th- there are other surprises as well uh so ancestor cell was the name of the book that i was failing to remember and shadow in the glass is the one that features the brigadier and hitler there's tons of stuff he wrote um it's like sting of the zygons art of destruction timeless frayed and Probably, given that he was the um, you know, the books editor, there may well have been a bit of free rights, possibly, <laughs> over the mm-hmm. years as well. Uh, there is a noble tradition in Doctor Who of that. Mm-hmm. This is set between the smugglers and the Tenth Planet. Mm. There really isn't like a narrative gap for it in those stories, but it's kind of put in there, and, and I think some other stuff has been set in that gap too. And the story itself is set in uh, May of uh, 90, but the millennium and the century are not specified. <laughs> Lance 
Terrence Parkin in one of his um, history books places this as taking place in 2890, but that's kind of his best guess because that's the time period when the Earth Empire is flourishing. And um, every chapter title in this is a reference to an Agatha Christie work. Yes, Agatha Christie's shadow looms large over this. I mean, uh, even the the title of the book is a uh, reference to a book that is now called And Then There Were None, uh, which uh, originally had a had a title that, uh, shall we say, you know, we dared say. Um, well, we can't. So, yeah. <laughs> so it has a very, very offensive word in it. And also uh, some Robert Heinlein elements too, I would say, in terms of the Marine troopers and mm. kind of a Christie yeah. Heinlein mashup yeah. in a way. With a bit of Eric Saywood scattered in. <laughs> for good measure kind of touching on the problematic element of the original mm. title um, yeah. one thing we should mention throughout this book there are some i guess you could say somewhat dated uh references to races and racial terms uh mm. throughout and it's I, I don't know how to say this exactly but it's a little problematic in its um depiction of race so terms like oriental are used quite a bit throughout the book mm. Had this been published today, I don't know that some of those terms would be used. Also, modifiers are used with with certain characters, but never with the white characters, which are considered the default. So an example from the the work, uh, she found two people crossing her path stealthily along an adjoining tunnel, a black woman with the most amazing blonde dreadlocks, and a man following on behind her. So it's references yeah. like that where it's, you know, whiteness is, is assumed as the default, which is looking at it, you know, in a, in a 2018 lens, we might be more attuned or, or sensitive to to these sorts of things, but wanted to mm. mention them too. There's also some sexist and homophobic language thrown in. Ben uses the term Nelly, but mm. that could be just more so in keeping with his character being from the, the mid-1960s. So I mean, He does get called out on it as well. He does, yeah. I was expecting racism and sexism in this book in the light of uh, the um, the first Doctor's appearance at Christmas, <laughs> or I was, I was looking for it rather than expecting it, but I didn't expect it to be coming from Ben and the, uh, the general narration. Yeah. Uh, but... <laughs> with those qualifiers and warnings out of the way. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I think we will not touch upon it too much. Worth mentioning, though, at the outset. Yes. Shall we begin talking the lovely people through the book? Sure. So it starts with Earth is at war with a group of terrorists known as the Ten Strong, which are an alien race called the Shur, or the Sheer. I'm not sure how we're going to pronounce that, but... I wonder whether it is kind of being pronounced Sheer, because also... Cause this this book is published in 2002, June 2002. I do wonder how much it's influenced by events in September 2001. Mm. And because also Shear is a, um, I, I, d- I don't want to use the wrong term, but it is a, it is a branch of, so of the Islamic faith. So I wonder whether it's possibly calling on that. I don't mm. know. This group of Shear um, are allied with a race called the Morphians, which are known for using um, magic. But of course, you know, this being Doctor Who, it's not really magic, but, you know, mm-hmm. advanced technology with magic and ritual. And the Shear and the Morphian are trying to attack the Earth Empire, which had annexed the Shear homeworld. We, co- we meet up with a group of, uh, they're really kind of space marines. Uh, they're Earth's anti-terror elite. They, these soldiers wear neural net, I guess they're like headbands or, or web mm-hmm. websets that uh, record their experiences and their memories for, for later review. Not unlike uh, what we saw in Sleep No More. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's an admiral, Admiral Nadina Hunt, and she's preparing to take a squad of trainees on uh, their final exercise before they graduate. And uh, they've already seen a, a lot of different combat over the years as trainees. And there are 10 soldiers total, uh, including Hunt and her um, second in command, uh, Shell. And they'll be sent to a location uh, predetermined by the Pentagon Central Computers to destroy uh, two kill droids, which are like training robots um, that are programmed to kill them. And as we're introduced to these 10 different characters and there are a lot of them and Mm. some of them i have to admit uh i may not have kept straight in my head as i was reading this yeah me too 
it's just a large cast of characters. We learn that some of them are hiding different secrets from each other, which can be difficult uh, because everyone has these kind of web set headbands that are re recording their thoughts and senses uh, and experiences. Uh, one of the soldiers is Matthew Shade, and he was he's kind of a natural earthborn citizen, uh, so he's uh, privileged compared to the other uh, Marines in his squad. And he um, joined this group to give something back uh, to prove. And, and one of the other Marines is um, an ex of his named uh, Dene. Giselle. Giselle. Yeah, Giselle Dene. Yeah, yeah. And he also has like shrapnel buried in his face, which mm. is which kind of scarred him for for life. And so we we get a little bit of that backstory too. There's a relatively useful series of info dumps because we see what the web sets have to say about all of the soldiers. Um, that's quite useful. It does bring you up to speed on well, it kind of highlights where some of the mysteries are and things like that, and uh, and it gives you. I don't really want to say a taste of the characters, but it kind of gives you a little bit of their backgrounds. Um, yeah. uh, so, which I thought it was, yeah, it, it was better that than having kind of clunky dialogue. Yeah, I, I thought that was a kind of a clever way to to get snippets of of each of the characters. Yeah. So uh, the trainees uh, enter suspended animation, and then they kind of wake up uh, by this planetoid, which is uh, on the edge of the Morphean quadrant. And uh, Shell uh, decides to kind of release the uh, kill droids into the training ground just to get ready for the exercise. And uh, they're going around this kind of complex, which basically has been made to look like kind of like a sheer you know, building. Uh, and uh, the um, the complex is uh, interestingly dotted with statues of cherubs, and uh, it's also bits of um, phosphorescent weed and some fleas um, that are kind of going around it, sort of, and it always making it impossible to track the other team members by their life signs. Which is handy. <laughs> this, uh, I have to say, made my skin crawl like throughout the book. Just all the, mm. all the references to to the fleas that are yes. present on this like asteroid that they're <laughs> wandering yeah. through. If, if if you have a thing against fleas, if we haven't put you off the book already, <laughs> then uh, yeah, yeah, maybe not the one for you if you have flea phobia or something. Yeah. So, um, Denny teams up with with a, a rather crass gentleman called um, Joiks. Uh, I think that's how we'll pronounce it, uh, or at least how I will, <laughs> and, uh, and sort of privately suggest to him that Haunt shouldn't be in charge of this mission um, because uh, she basically has uh, irrational hatred against the Sheer. Joyx waits until they're a little bit further on the tunnels uh, to make his move. Basically, if Denny wants to act, wants him to act, pardon me, against Haunt, then he wants her to do something for him in return. And they have to uh, take off their headsets in order to have that conversation. Yeah, because yeah. It's it's almost like um, prescient in a way with the whole. I don't know if you're, if you're having this same debate in England, but in in America right now, there's a a big push to get all police officers wearing body cams at all times, mm. and it reminded me a, a little bit of current events in that respect. Just the uh, you know having having recording devices going. At all times, just for safety and for um, to make sure that there's a accurate record of of what's happening. Yeah. So while the Marines are fanning out and going through the the station looking for these kill droids, the TARDIS materializes in an airless chamber, and the Doctor Ben and Polly don some spacesuits to emerge and and explore. And this is where our uh, dramatic reading comes in for the month, read by my husband, uh, also named Matt, and uh, we'll listen to that here. The TARDIS doors opened with the usual penetrating hum, and with the added beeping of some device that was depressurizing the control room. Ben felt a bit of a prat in his new astronaut gear. It was more like a wetsuit than a spacesuit, made from a dull green quilted material which felt a little too snug for comfort in all the wrong areas. The worst of it was the headgear, like looking out from a crystal ball. How do I look? Polly's voice crackled in his ears over the suit's communicators. Ben turned and whistled at the sight of Polly in her skin-tight, daffodil-yellow suit. Let's just say I hope this bleeding goldfish bowl don't steam up easily. Come along, you two, came the doctor's voice disapprovingly. We don't know quite what's out there, so stay close to me. So saying, he led the way out of the ship, fussing and pulling at his own spacesuit, which was dark blue. It was hard to believe he had his usual clothes on beneath a thermal material. His body looked thin and wasted, and his head disproportionately big through the glass helmet as a result. 
The old boy really did look like a buzzard now. Ben and Polly followed him out, then the doctor closed the doors. The comforting light spilling out from the control room narrowed to a slit, then vanished altogether. Don't lock them, doctor, Ben suggested as casually as he could. You never know, we might need to get back inside in a hurry. The doctor nodded vaguely. For a few seconds, the blackness was absolute. Dark, isn't it, said Polly. He felt her lightly grip his arm and gave her hand a comforting squeeze he hoped she could feel through her quilted gloves. Then the doctor flicked on his torch. The beam revealed small snatches of the cavernous room they stood in, and from them Ben tried to build a picture of their surroundings. The room, or cave, or whatever it was, was five-sided. The walls were built from layers and layers of dark stone, and scaled by ornate metal trellises that gleamed like gold. Above these, what looked to be ducting reached right around the room at the point where the walls sloped up to the high arched ceiling. Slabs of glass had been set into this roof, hundreds of them, and they winked and signaled back at the doctor whenever he shone his torch in their direction. Closer to ground level, banks of weird-looking machinery squatted beneath the trellises. Symbols carved in the slate above presumably denoted the function of each set of controls in whatever language they spoke here. Fascinating, the doctor said fervently. The functionality of a control room, but with the trappings of a shrine. Ben was considering the ramifications of this when the doctor's torchlight fell on a cowled shape hunched over a console right beside them, overlooked until now by the far-stretching beam. He felt Polly's grip on his arm tighten, and her distorted scream in his ears nearly deafened him. Ben took a few steps back instinctively. A hideous alien face was staring out at him from under the cowl. Its eyes were wide like a fish's, unseeing. It was lying in a mass of dried blood. So the Dr. Ben and Polly find themselves in an alien control room that's kind of set up like a, a shrine, and they find ten dead alien bodies. One is slumped over in a chair in a pool of dried blood, and that's the first body they discover. Mm -hmm. And the other nine are almost like stacked up in a pile mm. in a force field. It looks like a cube of glass, so they're mm. not able to get in and so touch the bodies or, any, yeah. or examine the bodies or anything. I should mention, too, the, the spacesuits they're wearing, I think, are the same spacesuits that Ben and Polly wear in the moon base, judging by their descriptions, but I'm not 100% mm. sure. I, I have to say, I did find um, the descriptions of, of Hartnell, uh, or the first doctor wearing a spacesuit, to be pretty funny <laughs> yes. to, to visualize that. So the, the chamber begins to fill with uh, light and air, and Polly becomes disoriented and she realizes that she's somehow been spirited away out of the room and is now lost in the tunnels as if someone moved her really really quickly she's trying to find her way back to the doctor and ben um, in the control room and she finds a porthole looking out into space and the stars are twinkling and outside of the porthole so she knows mm -hmm. she's um not like on a a planet or anything yeah. although she's in an in an asteroid polly then spots a blue light in the distance and it's uh, almost like a moth to a flame she's drawn towards it and she gets this sense of dread that she's feeling some sort of countdown happening but before she can make her way to the blue chamber she's attacked by one of the two uh kill droids that are loose in the in the training area meanwhile haunt and shell uh, managed to find their way to the control chamber they encounter the doctor and ben uh, much to uh, haunt surprise and uh, she uh, nearly shoots them before uh, Shell stops her. Uh, the doctor kind of points out the alien bodies and uh, Shell notices that they've all got prison brands seared into their flesh and so these are the bodies of the uh, Ten Strong, the uh, terrorist group mentioned earlier and so uh, one of them is the uh, terrorist leader De Castor uh, and uh, the uh, body outside the cube is De Castor's second in command Palomar and apparently they've got the most wanted terrorists in the Earth Empire lying here dead in the squad's training grounds. It makes me think of kind of Al Qaeda and the Bin Laden take there, mm. and the fact that that happened in in a major Pakistani military town. Um, I mean, obviously, this was not those events happened uh, years after this book was written, but so, uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's interesting how you see kind of echoes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so the doctor um, tries to get back to the TARDIS, um, but he finds that he's not actually able to open the door. Haunt is kind of still suspicious. 
orders a um, character called Frog uh, to take the Doctor and Ben back to the soldier's ship for questioning. And so Frog is, um, is a lady and her face and vocal cords were hideously damaged in childhood. She gets her her name from both her appearance and then also mm. just the she has to use like a vocoder yeah for her speech. While that's going on, two of the other soldiers, uh, Tavel and Shade, encounter Polly and they fight off the killjoid that's pursuing her. But in the process of destroying the the robot, they uh, bring down the tunnel and it blocks the way through to the cavern of blue light the complex is then further shaken by tremors as if the rockfall had caused a chain reaction starting everything to start collapsing although that's not what's <laughs> really going on we learn in a moment what what really is happening and then uh frog the doctor and ben find their way back to uh the ship blocked and as the the tremors continue joiks arrives in a panic claiming something came out of the darkness and took denny who's who was one of the uh, yeah. other soldiers yeah shade sex polly realizes that the tremors resemble the shaking of the tardis as it dematerializes and her suspicions are confirmed when the klaxon sounds from the control t- chamber and tavel who's a trained pilot he studies the controls in the chamber and confirms that the complex is broken away from the rest of the planetoid and is now in flight so mm-hmm. the whole section of the the asteroid or the planetoid they were in has now detached from the main part of the asteroid and is now under its own mm-hmm. i guess rocket power or thruster power and is heading off in some unknown direction yeah a bit dragonfire style Mm, mm -hmm. and then uh polly notices that one of the uh, sheer bodies has vanished from within the glass cube some folks are speculating that maybe it was you know disintegrated by vibrations through the force field or by one of the kill droids but they say you know it can't have moved by itself because you know when they scan the the bodies there's no signs of life in any of them and they all look you know, covered in blood and like something horrific has happened. But they do know that the complex only became active when the soldiers and the doctor's group arrived, which suggests that this is some kind of trap that's um, mm-hmm. that they they found themselves ensnared in. So uh, the doctor and his companions uh, find out a bit more about De Casta and, uh, and and his followers, and they objecting to their planet being repatriated by the Earth Empire, and. Uh, at, took advantage of uh, their links to the Morphian Quadrant to steal knowledge of the Morphians kind of like magic and to use them as kind of weapons of terror and uh, the Morphians are also attacking the Earth Empire in uh, retaliation um, for uh, for the theft of their secrets um, because the Shia are technically part of the Empire and the Morphians don't seem to be able to kind of draw like a distinction. That's what's kind of going on here from a political point of view. Uh, but what's actually happened right here in the complex, you know, uh, no one seems to know. I mean, maybe De Castro and Panama were having kind of like a falling out, some kind of power struggle. But uh, in any event, uh, the Doctor is able to sort of find out that the complex is being steered by uh, a kind of crystal navigation matrix but the crystals have been removed. And so while uh, the Doctor and Tovor can work out where their destination is, they can't actually change course at all. Mm. At this point, Haunt, who's the Admiral in, in charge, mm-hmm. uh, she decides to focus on Denny's disappearance. You know, over the Doctor's objections, she orders everyone out into the tunnels to look for her. Um, so you have groups splitting up into smaller teams. Mm. <laughs> as as is kind of the course for <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah kind of horror story yeah 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 and, yeah and horror stories too yeah so polly teams up with shade and lindy and she learns a little bit about you know the shrapnel um in his face that it was a result of him shielding a group of uh children from a frag grenade and he says he could get his face repaired, but he's chosen to keep the scars as kind of a reminder of the incident. But then Lindy, who's who's with him, she informs uh, him that she knows the true story. And when they get out of this, uh, she intends to blackmail him to uh, use his Earth connections on, on her behalf. She doesn't really explain what that is, um, because in a dark tunnel, um, something similar to what had snatched Polly away earlier uh, grabs her and pulls Lindy back into the tunnel. 
Shade and Polly aren't able to find her, but as Shade's conveying this in a report to Haunt, Polly notices that he's picked up Lindsay's uh, personal computer, kind of her palm screen or her... Uh, her iPad. Her iPad, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he uh, hides it in his combat suit. So Polly is very suspicious of Shade at this point. Mm. Yeah, it, it's, it's a shame that the first two characters to disappear are female. Mm. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it just kind of goes into some of the uh, the slight problematic attitudes that we were touching on earlier. Maybe. It's also the tropes of I think like the horror yeah. genre in general. Yeah. I do like that of the Marines. It is kind of like almost like a fifty-fifty breakdown between genders. That's true. And you do have Admiral Haunt in charge, so that's yeah nice to see but yeah having the the two women disappear first yeah uh meanwhile ben toba and a character i don't think we've mentioned before rober are uh, <laughs> um, attacked by kill droid um i would seen online that someone said that um, that rober is clearly a reference to the dominators because it's a mismatch or mixed match of, of two character names in that and i thought I don't think it's. Cl- I don't think Rover is clearly a reference to anything. Then again, maybe. <laughs> I didn't pick up on that either. Yeah. No. <laughs> Fair enough. So um, Ben wins the soldiers' respect by kind of taking out the kill droid. Meanwhile, Shell um, uh, and the Doctor and Polly uh, have kind of um, got together, and uh, they're attacked by uh, by the other kill droid, and uh, Shell is kind of is injured um, and he insists upon kind of like treating it himself and uh, the doctor and yes another character i don't think we've mentioned creeban uh will start examining the killjoy's weapons and uh, discover that the disintegrators haven't been fired which means that the killjoys are not responsible for uh, the disappearances they could kind of return to the complex to try to kind of figure out what they're doing past more cherub statues as they go and then, da da da, they discover that a second sheer body has gone, and also they have now worked out that they are heading straight into the heart of the Morphean quadrant, which I think would be where an episode would end, wouldn't it? If this was a TV story, I think so. Yeah, if if it was like a four-parter, that would be yeah, maybe the end of part one. And then uh, Haunt realizes so the admiral in charge she realizes that shade is in pain and he's forced to admit that his face feels as though it's bursting open frog prepares a force mattress for him which is a it's kind of a cool little it almost is like the size of like a like a key fob or something Mm -hmm. where you you push it and it will it's almost like an inflatable mattress but it's done with Mm -hmm. force fields it's it's like them carrying their bunk with them you know as a as a marine so they can sleep anywhere so she activates one for shade and for shell and the doctor kind of is speculating as to as to what's happening you know he's thinking it could be that the morphians are drawing the sheer towards their their space to exact revenge on the ten strong or you know and maybe the ten strong killed themselves once they realized what was happening but um could be unlikely Mm. uh the doctor tries to study the controls to see what else he can learn but then shell who's become more and more disoriented as the doctor's talking pulls a gun on him and then frog tries to shoot the gun out of shell's hand which blows his hand off and shell is revealed to be i don't know if it's like a robot or a cyborg Mm. um but he is more metal than (laughs) than 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 man so to speak and he uh shoots the console that the doctor was trying to examine and runs off into the tunnel system the training was supposed to be selected by random from the the pentagon central computers based on the soldiers participating in the in the exercise but at this point, it appears that someone or something altered the programming to send this group of Marines here purposefully for Shell to be able to, to kind of spring this. This reveal does remind me of, uh, is it Alien or Aliens? Oh, uh, when, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think Aliens, the second, the second yeah, one. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was Aliens. Yeah, definitely a kind of a vibe of Aliens and Eric Sayward. Mm. Um, whilst it may or may not be set in the 28th century it's definitely set in Eric Saywood time so and the space marines are right out of starship troopers 
Mm. It feels like to that old Heinlein story. Yeah, that's definitely true. Uh, which was also problematic as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a uh, there's an ignoble tradition of uh, very problematic uh, Starship Troopery stories. So Haunt sets off to fetch the others, and so while the Doctor and Polly are looking after Shade. And uh, Shade is in great pain. The dead tissue um, from all the scars is, is being forced out through his skin's pores, which is quite a grisly image. The doctor kind of gives him a painkiller, but then he turns around and he realises that the casters and polymorphs bodies have vanished. So two more of the sheer. Yes. Uh, the two who organised. So we are now down to six aliens. Uh, and uh, this is actually quite reminiscent of uh, the Agatha Christie book. And then there were none. Is uh, there are some um, there are some figures in that book that, that get broken or just generally things happen to during the course of that novel. Stephen Cole kind of uh, knows his uh, knows his Agatha Christie uh, as well as his Highline. Ben Tuvel uh, and uh, Robo and Horn uh, kind of like rush back into uh, the control complex and they've been kind of chased through tunnels by the chair of statues which have come to life. At which point I was like, wow, it's the Weeping Angels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very similar. The uh, <laughs> the cherubs are, so they're they're kind of similar to the, the baby Weeping Angels that mm. were depicted in Angels in Manhattan, but yeah. they're full-sized cherubs, which is yes. think, even creepier. Yeah. Uh, so whilst they're trying to build a barricade, Haunt collapses in pain uh, as a formerly undiagnosed tumour liquefies and is expelled through her body. Uh, and then the doctor reckons that there must be some kind of uh, process happening to kind of drive impurities out of the soldier's flesh, and uh, that this process also had a kind of like affected um, shell and his kind of organic and mechanical parts. And so maybe what's going on is that this is part of a plan to reanimate the ten strong. Uh, and so like maybe there'll be ten humans for ten shit. And then this seems to be confirmed by the fact Rog's flesh is changing from that of a human into that of a sheer. Mm. And Joix insists mm-hmm. upon killing Frog before she turns on them. Frog tries to escape, but then Tovel, one of the other marines, stuns her, and then Haunt uh, recovers long enough to order the team to work together to, to try and solve this. Mm-hmm. Tovel decides to check out that cavern of blue light from earlier, which Polly had saw, uh, the do- and the doctor thinks that might, that might house the asteroid fragments uh, engine that's kind of driving them into Morphean space. Polly stays behind in the complex uh, the bridge control area to watch over uh, Frog, Shade and Haunt who are now all suffering from Mm -hmm. their impurities being expelled and the the porthole that Polly saw earlier out to look at the stars acts as a marker and then she's also created some markers with some stacks of stones from when she was lost earlier but um, once they clear the rock fall all the humans in the party so everyone except the doctor is um, kind of mesmerized by the blue light the doctor resists the the light's effects and is able to snap the others out of it before they walk into the propulsion units and these propulsion units are really really gross <laughs> because they're <laughs> they're powered by um, organic matter so imagine like seeing like a warp core from Star Trek, but seeing like hands and arms and faces in the swirling matter. It's just really creepy. Yeah. And they're kind of, you know, drawn to it and the, and the doctor snaps them out of it. The mix of organic matter is both human and sheer, mm. which suggests that the Morphians might be the ones behind what's happening here. Polly uh, notes that uh, Shade is kind of trying to erase files uh, from uh, Lindy's um, sort of iPad type thing and uh, demands an explanation. Basically, he confesses that uh, he signed up uh, to um, show that he wasn't kind of pampered and privileged. But uh, when his team were ambushed, he basically fled in terror and was hit by a fragmentation grenade and left his men to die. Uh, And it was only uh, his connections back home at Earth managed to save him from uh, court martial and uh, being executed and the reason why he keeps the scars is to remind himself of his cowardice and uh, he was able to kind of doctor his record and re-enter the service but Lindy discovered all of this and she was going to blackmail him so Polly promises to keep his secret 
Um, but then realised she's accidentally erased the files herself in any case. <laughs> yeah, whoops. And, uh, and Frog starts trying to kind of cut the sheer flesh out of her body in panic. But uh, Haunt suddenly wakes up and... Uh, and stops her because uh, she doesn't want to let anybody else on her team die. A mm. couple of the other soldiers, Krebin and Joix, find two discarded websets, so the headsets, near the propulsion units, mm. and Joix tries to destroy them. And when when asked about it, he admits that he made a pass at Denny in exchange for supporting her bid to oust uh, Haunt from her command. And... The others are very suspicious of him now because of this and thinking that, you know, he might be responsible for her disappearance. But that's quickly put aside when two of the stone angels fly in and attack and they uh, rip Joyks apart and they, they <laughs> throw his body into the, the propulsion drives. Mm. And uh, the rest of the humans uh, retreat back to the the control chamber, kind of shooken up by the violence. And the doctor mm. um, looks at it, though, and thinks it's kind of a hopeful sign that the Morphians are um, trying to dominate and impose their will upon what they consider a weaker species and kind of in that Hartnell tradition you know so mm. gives a little speech and he says you know that means they're flawed and they can be defeated yeah. trying to, to rally everyone's spirits after the violence that they just witnessed from the angels it's, it's like the weeping angels if they weren't quantum locked they can <laughs> yes <laughs> they can much. move and fly and attack you i did wonder whether steve moffat has, has ever read this <laughs> <laughs> i know it's not the official explanation of where he got his idea from for the weeping angel that speech from the doctor is brilliant i think it's, it's it, it for me I mean, it just really kind of conjured up as you say hartnell uh, and, and it's also worth saying that that they kind of think that the angels, they think that they might be able to reason with them just before they rip uh, Joyks apart, that they're realising that, that they can't reason with them at all. Mm -hmm. So a frog, meanwhile, realises, uh, because of all the transformations happening, she can actually speak um, without her electronic vocoder. Rover uh, sort of panics because uh, he realises he's also changing into a shear and runs off into the tunnels and uh, Haunt lets them go. And they then start examining the websets that's been found, and uh, they find uh, one belonging to Lindy and one to Shell. Uh, and uh, Shell's been uh, caught by the angels, and he's also been kind of ripped apart and chucked into the drive. Because Shell was an android, he was able to interact with the neural net more effectively, and so they're able to determine that he's not responsible for all of this. Uh, and uh, sort of when he shot the control panel, he might have been trying to actually draw the doctor's attention to something near it, which um, seems like an odd way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of doing things. Um, but so he was a bit disoriented at the time. So because Shell wasn't responsible, then obviously somebody else must be. And seeing as Denny was the first to disappear and her website still hasn't been found, uh, she would seem the logical suspect. And I have to say, they leap on that. They really do. And I'm just like, uh, yeah. But then I guess uh, everybody's scared. I was quite surprised how much the you know, the characters were trying to kind of sell to you the idea that you know, clearly Denny did it. I mean, that's right out of Agatha Christie where you have oh, yes. different suspects and it's, it's this person. No, it's this person. And yeah, yeah. I found that to be more of just like a maybe a shorthand of the, of the genre. But yeah, I, I agree. It seemed like kind of an illogical conclusion to jump to. <laughs> Given, given everything else they've experienced. Yes, yeah. So at this point, the doctor is studying the control panel that Shell had shot up, and he realizes that some of the circuits are similar to those in the TARDIS. Mm. The force field is, in fact, a time stasis field, and there's a small crystal embedded in the glass field, which the Shear are able to use to transmit commands to outside of the frozen space. And this must create some sort of time spillage, which is hand wavy explanation as, <laughs> as to why the TARDIS is sealed off yes. and um, why DeCaster and Palomar, um, two of the Shear, seem to vanish so quickly. But the doctor's wondering, you know, if, if the Shear are responsible for what's happening, why is there Shear flesh in the propulsion units as well? And before the doctor can put together a theory as to what's going on, the Stone Angels attack again, and Shades successfully shoots one of them with a grenade launcher and it bursts apart into millions of fleas. Dun, dun, dun. So the uh, 
angels aren't weeping angels as we know them, but they're stone angels made up of all these fleas. It could still be the source of the weeping angels, no? It could be. <laughs> I don't know. I, when I when I think of the weeping angels, I don't want to think of them being made up of insects. <laughs> no, Although that is kind of no, creepy. Yes. Uh, maybe chris chibnall's gonna run with that idea <laughs> chris chibnall you need to reconcile 10 little aliens with the weeping angel stories please <laughs> yes yeah, so i'm sure that's a priority for jenny whisker's first season number one start with yeah. that <laughs> Yes. Um, so the Morphians uh, have used the fleas as raw flesh with which to construct the angels and almost like a golem sort of mm-hmm. creature. So the complex's life support systems uh, shut down and uh, the soldiers realize that they can't risk splitting up to uh, look for the controls uh, whilst the angels are kind of out and about. Which makes sense, but then, you know, they've split up before, so... <laughs> Haunt uh, then suggests that maybe they use the web sets to transmit rather than record, so uh, the soldiers can keep an eye on one another, um, regardless of where they are. And the Doctor rewires the web sets, which, I, I don't know, that doesn't sound very Hartnell. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's not really kind of like telepathy as such, because the Doctor's able to block his thoughts. Basically, we just enter this section where it becomes a choose and adventure novel. <laughs> Which I was super excited about, even though it was spoiled for me in the in the intro or the the author's note because uh, yeah. he makes reference to it. But as a fan of choose your own adventure books and and having a complete set, mm. also being a fan of all the Doctor Who choose your own adventure books that have been released over the years under different titles like Find Your Fate and Decide Your Destiny. Yeah, I was really excited for this bit. <laughs> and also, it works really well on the Kindle because uh, mm. I, I was wondering how are you going to do this uh, but they have various kind of like hyperlinks embedded that don't necessarily always take you to the exact page but it, if it isn't the exact page it's a page or two before so you just kind of like just move through because like I was dreading having to just kind of like move my way around from page number to page number or something kind of like bad uh, but uh, sorry, you were going to say something else. Oh no, I was just, I was going to reference the same thing with the the Kindle and the hyperlinks mm. that seemed to work pretty well. Just looking at the the paperback, it was done by page number, similar to the old uh, or section number, I should say. Yeah. But yeah, that was really cool to find a way to do that within a story so it's it's just contained to this one chapter which um it's appropriately named after the agatha christie work uh the spider's web because yes you got all those jumping around points but it's i read through the section twice once just kind of jumping around and and following the Mm. you know you know if you want to see what polly's thinking turn to this page (laughs) yes yeah if you want to continue on and follow haunt go here yeah i just thought it was well done it was kind of self-contained and really clever and something that i hadn't seen in any other doctor who novel like this um, yeah i think the closest was probably the jim mortimer book we read eye of heaven you know where they flip back and forth between settings not not so yeah. much in terms of like picking a path but just mm. it being you know such a non-traditional narrative structure yeah i mean obviously your choices don't influence the narrative it might it is possible to kind of go through a short path but you'll be you'll get the main story beats yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting way of doing things, as you say. Uh, I did. I read through it a second time, mm. just in order, because um, yeah. there were a couple of things that Choose Your Own Adventure books used to do that were kind of infuriating for readers. One is that they would include random pages of parts of the story that you couldn't access, so that <laughs> there'd be no way to get to a certain page. So yes. I read through that to see if he did that, which he didn't, which was good. And then yeah. the other kind of conceit that they would sometimes do would be to stick you in a time loop, where if you, like, say, get lost in, mm. like, a cavern or something, you'd get into a cycle of flipping back and forth between two different pages uh, forever, which uh, Stephen Cole also fortunately didn't do here. Mm. But I, I read through it that way just to make sure. If if you're doing this book as kind of like bedtime reading this is not a section for bedtime reading because you just need to well, certainly for me i was wanting to kind of concentrate and kind of go back and forth and everything so uh, yeah definitely put some time aside for this bit you can't pick it up and drop it some of the characters too like marines that mm. we don't spend as much time with Krebin and um you know some of the soldiers it was like okay i'm not sure which which person this is but <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm going into their viewpoint yes, um, yes. but it but it wasn't super confusing because, you know, you have them all divided up into three different groups. So mm. easy to keep track of that way. Um, so I mean, if, we, if we just kind of resume the narrative as fragments as it now becomes, uh, Polly is able, because we were saying that the Doctor's um, uh, been, he, he's blocking his thoughts. 
because Stephen Cole observes the editorial view that you can't read the Doctor's thoughts. And if you wonder why, read the Eye of Heaven. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. Polly does try to read his thoughts and uh, she kind of picks up this uh, this momentary kind of terrifying glimpse of being a vital young mind trapped in an old dying body. Almost like there's a regeneration about to happen. Uh, yeah, so the soldiers are kind of going off in search of the life support and the missing nav crystals. And Frog has to um, remain in the control chamber because so much of her flesh is now sheer. Uh, and also, she can barely move. When others try to access the Doctor's memories, they're blocked by a uh, penny farthing, the uh, the symbol from the prisoner. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a reference to the Space Museum when um, I think yes, they, they tried think to read, read his mind in that and he blocked it with the same image. Yeah, yes, I think so. So then the Doctor uh, teams up with Haunt, the, the Admiral. They're both kind of in the back of the pack, so to speak, because they're older and are a little bit more tired. So Haunt has has a flashback to, to some of, of her experiences with in the in the war with the Shear, and she breaks out of the flashback and they go on to find Roba, who is one of the soldiers sitting and paralyzed in a tunnel with a web set on his head, which was placed there by one of the angels. Roba was the guy who ran off um, in fear because he was being transformed earlier. Earlier, yeah. And he's even more like the Shear now and mm. Through him, the team sees the memory of one of the ten strong, and we learn that those ten sheer submitted willingly to the quote-unquote death of the stasis field, all except for Palomar, who was you know sitting separately from the from the other nine, who feared DeCaster's ambition and that they might be betrayed you know to the Earth Empire. So Palomar is the only one of the sheer who was truly killed. So it's probably his flesh that was in the propulsion drive that they noticed mm-hmm. earlier. Hunt agrees to let Roba live. Uh, even though he's acting more and more like like one of the sheer her and the doctor proceed on because they see some movement up ahead and when they when they investigate they're attacked by the angels Mm -hmm. and um haunt is removed or disconnected from the neural net as uh she orders the team to stay together and that's where the uh i think that was the last scene in the choose your own adventure portion uh where where she says you know she she disconnects from the neural net and tells them all to to stay together yeah i think you're right so in, in another um, thread of choose your own adventure type stuff, uh, Polly and Shade have uh, teamed up, and uh, Polly notices that uh, Shade's face is damage free. You know, she tells him that she basically accidentally erased Lindy's files, and so he's got this opportunity to have a clean start. But then, when Haunt is removed from the network, uh, Shade uh, you know, feels that you know, he's he's a jinx. And then he and Polly find that porthole again from earlier where they've got the stars twinkling like diamonds beyond. And uh, we, we then get a little bit of a glimpse into Polly's past uh, where uh, she kind of realises that shades like the other blokes that she'd meet at the um, at the nightclubs that would be kind of wounded and seeing her only as a girl that can make her feel better for a while. There's an implication that she'd be quite often taking, um, taking blokes home from the nightclubs. <laughs> Um, yes, which is yeah, fair play. <laughs> Not seemingly wildly out of character, either. Maybe she was from kind of like swinging London and stuff. So yeah, that kind of makes a bit of sense. And so she then decides to kind of reach out to the twinkling stars as if she could touch them. And then she realizes she's found the missing nav crystals, <laughs> which they've been kind of they've <laughs> hidden they, there. Yeah, yeah they look like stars. So she kind of reaches out and plucks the stars out of the porthole. But also, these stars haven't been moving. <laughs> They've been in the same formation throughout. Yeah. And, and it is a bit of a reach. It's like, oh, I'll just go and touch the stars. It's like, you're being hunted by killer angels made of fleas. <laughs> why are you touching portals? <laughs> oh, it's useful that you do, but why? Uh, so uh, she and Shade reach out to the doctor, uh, who tells them to uh, keep their uh, discovery a secret because he doesn't know how much uh, the Shear have managed to kind of hack into uh, internet. 
and while this is happening, Ben is searching the tunnels with Toval, and mm. Toval seizes up and he's paralyzed, and Ben's unable to help him. And I think that the implication there is Toval's also changing into a mm. into a shear, and yeah. um, he's forced to kind of leave him there lying down, and Ben has to continue searching alone. Krebin, one of the other soldiers, finds the life support controls, and Ben joins him, and they start work on on repairing the system but then they realize it was way too easy to fix so they they're puzzled by that and then they're also wondering why because they still think denny might be behind this um why she hasn't sent the stone angels to stop them the doctor realizes that the sabotage you know through the the neural net that the sabotage to the life support system was a distraction to get them out of the control chamber but it's too late because the angels have already deactivated the stasis field and released the remaining shear that were part of the ten strong in the control chamber. At least this group of shear and the morphians, it turns out they're working together after all. And then all is revealed when the doctor turns around and he sees Admiral Haunt enter the control chamber holding him at gunpoint. And it turns out she's the traitor mm. that set this all up. End of episode three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, the real killer revealed. Which, it makes sense, because, you know, she's mm. the one who set up the training exercise, and she picked the location and got them all there, so, yeah, she's yeah. she was the mole working with the Sheer and the Morphians. It, it does make sense, I and mean, I also, I must say, I wasn't trying to think as to who was responsible, just because I knew that it wouldn't have been uh, Denny, uh, but I was just trying to think as to... <laughs> We've had so many red herrings. I'm not, not going to try to work it out. I thought the twist would have been that there wasn't a mall and that you mm. know it just was something that they stumbled into. But it yeah. makes sense the way Stephen Cole went here too. So yeah. So DeCaster is uh, is surprised uh, when the, the other humans are entering the chamber because uh, they've completed the initial stages of the ritual and so basically all of the humans should be paralyzed by now and the doctor says that he's managed to stop the um, the kind of like the paralyzing pulse but he doesn't kind of go into how he's managed to do this and sort of says that he won't unless the sheer explain what's going on and so uh, de Castor says that the uh, terror rituals have taken their toll on the ten strong's flesh they plan to lure ten human soldiers here in order to purify their flesh and absorb it, thus restoring themselves to full strength. It does make you kind of think, well, what's in this for Haunt? Mm. So the um, the initial setup was supposed to confuse the soldiers and set them off investigating non-existent mystery, whilst uh, two shear were released to uh, to cast the preliminary stages of the ritual. And Palomar had betrayed the shear to Pentagon Central, which is why Shell had been sent in undercover. And because the caster has killed Palomar, uh, the Shear only need nine bodies instead of ten. Yeah, that was why, yes. And uh, so that's why Denny was killed. When the Doctor and his companions had arrived, basically all this extra flesh had kind of threatened to destabilise these rituals. And so the Morphine Angels were kind of culling more of the humans, picking them at random, since they were unable to distinguish between them. And uh, killing Yoikes uh, when Haunt had um, stopped Frog from killing herself. So they need like a ratio of one to one. Yeah. Know, the same number of Shear as humans. And because there were extra humans, they had to go. Yeah, yeah. Weird ritual yeah. stuff. Isn't it? This kind of reminded me of some of the other faction paradox stuff that had been mm. going on in some of the books at the time. Just the whole idea of ritual, ceremony, magic, and there being, you know, technological underpinnings for all of that, but that it's carried out in almost this kind of theatrical way that you sometimes get on the series with like, mm. um, like an image of the Fendal and, and other stories where the, the, that kind of mix that magic and ritual element with technology. So now the Doctor realizes that the Morphians don't represent all of their species or even a majority dissidents like the Shear who are working against the Earth Empire expansion. These Morphians want to become corporeal again because I guess the Morphians are energy-based beings or I'm not mm. it wasn't too clear on, on that piece of it but most of the Morphians don't care about the activities of the human race but they're planning on changing because the Ten Strong once they're able to do this ritual and take on the the bodies of the humans the the rituals would enable the Morphian uh, dissidents to break open the mind force of their race and take control so giving them the the upper hand and in the I'm not sure how that works like a non-corporeal battle <laughs> but <laughs> yes. um the, the plan is that the, the Ten Strong would then launch an attack on Earth, 
with the full backing of the Morphean Quadrant and using the same sort of transformation ritual to convert all humans into sheer, uh, which then the Morphians could then possess those bodies. So it's, it's so it's like the, the Morphians are the minds and the sheer are the bodies, I guess, and together they're, they're like a whole. You'd have thought that the Morphean Quadrant would have some kind of safeguards to kind of stop random people hacking into the mind force. Mm, mm -hmm. Uh, Because surely these are not the first people to have tried this. Yeah, there must be some way in or or something that this group of Morphians have discovered. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. It's it's kind of an unanswered question. Yeah, well, you also, you don't know how accurate their theory is so either Mm. really i mean these are dissidents you could just be dealing with mad extremists without any particular knowledge of what they're doing um so yeah when it comes to that yeah they they might be fantasists yeah that's Uh, that's very true and and plus with it having the unreliable narrator aspect of it too um, yeah this point it's really speculation as to what's happening and i don't know that we ever get a clear i don't think we do no (laughs) no so by this point, uh, the asteroids nearing the heart of the Morphean Quadrant and the ritual is kind of getting ready for uh, completion. So uh, the rate of change is kind of beginning to kind of speed up. So all of the soldiers are finding their flesh are transforming into sheer. And uh, the angels decide to fetch in Tobble and Roba into the control chamber uh, for the completion of the ritual. And the caster and haunt drag the doctor over to those propulsion units um, to force him to kind of to release that paralyzing pulse. And uh, the doctor uh, whispers to Polly that there's still some time to turn things around. And then she realizes that he actually means this literally because she's got the nav crystals. She can change the direction of the uh, of the asteroid and pilot it back out of the quadrant. But they need to distract the sheer first because even though the sheer because of the ritual, they can't kill any of the remaining humans. The angels could still torture them. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ben and Shade uh, use those uh, force mattress capsules, those kind of like pop up beds uh, that we spoke about earlier, um, Chekhov's pop up bed, uh, to uh, create a distraction and flee. And, uh, and so whilst the angels are off after them, Polly uh, tries to reinstall the nav crystals. And the doctor comes to the conclusion that Admiral Hunt was rescued from the ruins of her colony, not by her fellow humans, but by the Shear, who planted a tumor in her body. And even as they were planning this, they needed a traitor on the inside, and only by um, helping them conduct the ritual could she get rid of the tumor. And she blamed herself for the death of uh, some of her fellow soldiers on the colony, and she tries to make amends by killing as many Shear afterwards as she could, but she eventually realizes that she too has kind of become a terrorist and just killing innocent civilians and never getting close enough to the Morphians. In a twisted way, she wants the Morphians to be able to complete this ritual and get bodies of their own so that humans have a target to fight against and, you know, kill them properly. And um, she's the one who suggested that the fleas in the in the complex should take on the form of the angels as kind of like a metaphor for guiding her and her people to their rest. So take on on, <laughs> on, on her thought processes and, and how, uh, how this all came to be. You mentioned the colony that she was kind of rescued from. Both of the colonies in this book are um, are named after American or Canadian places, which was one of these things because I, I yeah I don't read these books in one sitting. Uh, I was having to kind of like remember you got references in like Toronto and I think it's I think isn't there Idaho or somewhere mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. uh, and and it's like yeah it's not it's not the one that we know on Earth it's another place. <laughs> DeCaster has now cost on to why the doctor's so weak. He's been managing to hold back the paralyzing pulse with his own mind, using the first doctor's telepathic skills that uh, he and Susan would every now and again show when the plot needed it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the angels um, start uh, kind of pummeling the doctor until uh, you know, he's not able to resist anymore, and uh, the paralyzing pulse enters the network which freezes the humans. And then Haunt surrenders herself to the caster, who then consumes her body, <laughs> regaining his strength, uh, having had a nice meal, uh, casts the final ritual. That was kind of horrific, the whole... Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that whole description, yeah. Yeah. Um, through the neural net, the Doctor kind of senses that his friends are fading away, 
um, and he can also uh, sense uh, the presence of Shell, uh, you know, the android from earlier, uh, and that Shell's kind of left a trait of himself inside the net. So the Doctor reaches out to him and urges him to kind of help them resist. And so, therefore, kind of the ritual, this this final ritual, suddenly starts kind of going wrong, and then the Shear are finding themselves paralysed. Tobal is almost kind of going into their influence, and uh, then he tries to kill Polly, and uh, then he's fought off by uh, by Creven and uh, and Roba, realizing that he's kind of changing into a Shear and he's not able to do anything about it, puts a force mattress capsule. <laughs> in his mouth and bites down on it ripping himself apart oh. which yeah that's nice and grim and so kind of seeing that uh, Toval manages to kind of shake off the influence of the sheer and and he kind of starts operating the uh, the navigational controls and they're able to to turn the ship around and the yeah the farther they they get out of morphian space the less powerful the morphian's influence are they're able to um reverse the the effects of changing into into the shear so roba's death destabilizes the ritual completely and that energy feeds back into the bodies of the shear killing them uh, once and for all hmm. and then the the breaking of the ritual also enables the the morphian mind force that we talked about earlier to strike back against the dissident morphians and the angels disintegrate into the fleas that kind of made them up and then shade and ben uh reach the propulsion units and at the doctor's prompting <laughs> shade kicks uh decaster into the drive <laughs> feeding it with uh his flesh uh giving which decaster was in um haunt's body yeah giving it the complex a boost of power helping it to accelerate out of morphine space all that faster and then uh, the doctor rigs up a transmitter with some of the leftover parts of the the shattered nav console, and Shade the android is able to. Or is Shade the android or is Shell? No, the no, Shell's the android. Okay. The doctor rigs up a transmitter, and Shade uh, programs it to transmit a distress call. So it's similar to Frog. He's been given a, a second chance, and he intends to to use it properly. And because there's no more time spillage, the TARDIS is now unlocked and accessible. And the Doctor and his companions are able to enter and, and leave. And the book ends with them hopeful that the, the survivors of this will learn from their experience and, and treat the remaining Sheer, you know, the non-dissident ones, hmm. with compassion and understanding to hopefully prevent hmm. future atrocities. Although we know, you know, the Earth Empire, not the friendliest. Uh, <laughs> no. There, there'll probably be more in the future. Yes, probably so. So probably ends so. Uh, Ten Little Aliens. Hmm. So what did you think of that one? Um, yeah, it's it's weird because we said at the start that there's problematic stuff in here. And also, I wasn't really getting much of a feel of some of the characters throughout. And so I was finding it hard to kind of, to get involved, particularly. Mm. It's a murder mystery, so there will be bits of the characters that are kind of like being kept from you just so that you know, can in theory you know suspect anybody uh, that isn't a member of the Sardis crew but I don't know I I, I very much enjoyed the uh, the choose your own adventure thing and it didn't feel particularly gimmicky mm. I, I just it, it it didn't sing in quite the same in, in quite the way that I would have hoped to mm. but it is interesting because this has to have been written I think as a response to 9-11 yeah I, yeah even though it was published in June don't know what the turnaround time would have been i think stephen yeah. cole references those events in in his author intro too uh, so okay, I, right. I, I think you're spot on I, I i agree with you that some of the characters especially you know the 10 different marines a few of those were almost interchangeable where you didn't get a sense and it'd, it'd be hard to develop characters for all of them yeah um I do think where this really shines is his characterization of the Doctor Ben and Polly. True. Yeah. I don't think Ben had quite as much to do. It was nice to see Polly figure more heavily mm. into the storyline than than Ben did. But I, I just thought Cole's uh, characterization of all three was just really accurate, and that for me evoked. It was a little bit of a disconnect because you had I had such clear images of of those three characters from the '60s, and then layering on the space marines and the the murder mystery on top of that 
um, some of that didn't, and some of the violence especially felt out of place, you know, for the first Doctor's era in terms of what's depicted and stuff. But I mean, that's just, uh, you, you'd get that in any of the novels of this mm-hmm. era. The violence kind of runs, th- runs through them. I don't, I don't think in the new series books you'd, you'd get quite as detailed descriptions of uh, <laughs> decapitations and limbs being severed and all sorts of things like that. No, but also I, I don't think it was, it was unpleasant, but it wasn't like, for me, it didn't put me off it, mm, mm-hmm. and it it is also interesting sometimes when you have a TARDIS crew popping up in a story that would feel more appropriate for a different a different iteration of the show. So, because like I mean, I've said Eric Sayward. I mean, this does feel like a Fifth Doctor story that uh, the uh, that the Doctor, you know, that the First Doctor just happens to have wandered into. Mm. But I, I think it is interesting to have that juxtaposition. But uh, just as it's interesting as well, like in Black Orchid, where you have um, the Fifth Doctor in a historical that would have possibly felt a bit more appropriate for William Hartnell. I might have preferred a little bit more Agatha Christie and a little bit less Robert Heinlein. Yeah, maybe. I think you know one way to do that would have been to not make all of the ten characters Marines. You know, maybe six of them were Marines, and maybe you'd have like two Earth attaché people. You know, just people with yeah. different motivations to to mix it up a little bit. But that that's really a small criticism i think so maybe have an archaeologist yeah (laughs) there's a couple different ones to choose from (laughs) yes yeah because also that's the thing is because it's this i mean i say eric say would it also this would with the violence toned down a bit does also feel like a Stephen Moffat story. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah. Parts of it did feel very much Time of Angels and Flesh and Stone mm. when you had the group of kind of space marines, although they were from the Church of the Papal Mainframe. Yeah, the soldiers in that one, but similar. And one of the soldiers even references uh, Spectrox so from yeah. uh, Caves of Androzani, just another one of those kind of tie-ins to the the Sayward era. Yeah, and and the Doctor referencing you know his impending changes. Mm-hmm. You could tell this story took a lot out of him, and yes. maybe uh, helped lead to his uh, upcoming uh, rejuvenation as he calls it (laughs) yes i did notice one uh continuity error in the Mm -hmm. book the tardis is referred to as having a uh, pentagonal and not a hexagonal console i have to wonder if that was a search and replace error in the editing because the chamber that's in most of this book is a pentagonal chamber so i'm I'm, I'm wondering if that crept in that way or but that that was early on in the book because it it was like oh we're dealing with the the, with the day pole tardis here (laughs) maybe so how are you going to rate this? Oh, hmm. I think it's well written. Um, as we talked about, there were some problematic elements. I think I'm going to give this one a seven. It's a strong story. It is engaging, but there are things that did take me out of it and certain things that didn't mesh very well. I, I really, really loved the Choose Your Own Adventure chapter. But yeah, I think a, a seven for me. How about how about you? Yeah, I, I think I think it's six. The, the problematic stuff and and also not particularly engaging with the characters but as you say it you know it's frustrating because it's well written Stephen Cole could definitely write uh and but I yeah it, it did it did disappoint me on 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 some levels but I was so glad that the uh, you know that, that choose your own adventure bit is great mm. yeah, that, that could have <laughs> so, gone very wrong very quickly but it, it did oh it. yes and yeah. it I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show um, on Netflix called Sensate, but that chapter reminded me a little bit of that, where you had eight mm. different people inside each other's heads, similar yeah, to, to that. Okay. I haven't got past the first episode of Sensate, but uh, I, I'm I am told that um, that kind of with Netflix and, and their analysis, apparently most if if you get past the first two episodes of Sensate, you are likely to watch the whole thing. Because I I know that if I do kind of plow on through, I have a few Doctor Who alumni to uh, to see in it. Mm-hmm. We should mention too our <laughs> scale is out of ten for our mm. new listeners. Who... Oh yes, this is true. Okay. Yes, it's not it's not out of a hundred. It's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, yes. Shall we uh, move on to some listener mail? Hmm. Let's. We have some new tweets and some new listeners this month. Um, special thanks to longtime listener Sixth Pi for all of their retweets. They are much appreciated. Jeff Waddell on Twitter writes, mm-hmm. 
Ten Little Aliens is a fantastic story, though the section where they all where they go all communications isn't Hartnell era like at all. Uh, he says brilliant realization of the three main characters. The Weeping Angels started here. Absolutely love this story. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can I can see that. Uh, I, I don't think we liked it quite as much as Jeff. I, I can see, to your point, Chris, earlier, I have to wonder if Stephen Moffat read this <laughs> at, <laughs> at some point. It's uncanny how similar the angels are it, in certain places. Yes, isn't it just? Yeah. We also got a tweet from uh, Once Upon a Geek, both a tweet and an email. He writes, uh, so glad you ran the ad in the Gallifrey One program. That's how I found you. I'm a big mm. Doctor Who novel fan and listen Mm. to the previous book club podcasts working through your episodes now we'll drop an email soon keep up the great work oh brilliant uh we've got the email from him Mm -hmm. he goes by shag matthews yes (laughs) yes and he does so on facebook as well (laughs) and uh he's from the fire and water podcast network which uh mainly focuses on comics oh cool he writes uh hi chris and matt so glad I found your podcast. I'm a huge fan of the Doctor Who novels going back to 1983 and my beat up copy of Keys of Marinus. Um, mm, which was written by Philip Hinchcliffe, bizarrely. <laughs> comes to mind is the, uh, I don't know if you listened to Verity, but um, Erica Ensign's mother had that episode uh, on VHS. And for the title of it, she wrote Doctor Who collecting those keys. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, that's not a favorite story. (laughs) He says, I discovered your show from the advertisement in Gallifrey One convention program, so it successfully grabbed at least one more listener. He said he listened to the earlier incarnation of the show, and he just started catching up this week, and he's made it through four episodes already. He really enjoys our insights into the novels, some of which we haven't read in 20 years or so. Uh, Keep up the great work, LLZ. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matthews, for your... (laughs) for your uh kind words i appreciate it yes yeah very much so we also have one other email um Mm -hmm. this one from listener jen she's writing in to say that the voicemail from india fisher was really cool Mm -hmm. um so folks who may not listen all the way through to the end for our podcast if you go back to uh seeing i i uh i did manage to track down that voicemail (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that I had asked Idea for, and it's, it's in that episode. And she asks, uh, what pieces we use in the intro and outro? Um, I think we answered this before, but it was a while ago. The opening bumper is the uh, PBS uh, Children's Television Workshop logo mm-hmm. that was used from, like, I want to say 83 until the mid-90s. And then the ending bumper is the BBC Home Video logo, which was in use, I think, early 80s through i want to say 88 or 89 or possibly longer than that maybe uh Mm. but uh, but yeah yeah uh, yeah, it might have been in use still into the 90s because it it certainly let's just say it brings back memories (laughs) (laughs) um so that may be our first frequently asked question (laughs) Mm, yes cool so uh do we have anything from the facebooks we've had a few likes from various folks and uh on on facebook we 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 have also heard from mr matthews and uh, we also heard from uh joe candora who uh said that it fills the void after the demise of his favorite podcast the oncoming storm which is uh that's great company which to keep yeah it's good it's it's good to see uh yeah interactions on, on, on on there and also on twitter so yeah do please keep it up uh, folks it's it's yeah it's 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 great to know that we're not talking into kind of like a void yeah um, <laughs> any and all feedback is appreciated yes yes even if it's pointing out my my numerous mistakes <laughs> <laughs> and mine too <laughs> yes yes because uh, yeah i have a confession most new series episodes i just watched them once <laughs> not because i don't enjoy them i, I think it's because like back in the day, having been a teenager in the 90s, I did rewatch a lot of the old Doctor Who because there was no sign of any new visual material anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, anyway, right. right. With that shocking reveal done, um, <laughs> <laughs> what, I think we get to the point where we find out what we're reading next month. It's uh, my pick this mm. time. For those who are keeping tabs at home, we haven't done a sixth Doctor or a ninth Doctor book yet. Or a fifth. Or a fifth Doctor. So of those three, I've decided to go with a uh, ninth Doctor book. Mm. We don't have a lot to choose from. There were <laughs> <laughs> uh, six novels and two graphic novels. Mm-hmm. One is by Panini, which collected the DWM strips, and then 
uh, one more recently by Titan. Mm -hmm. Of the six novels, three are with the Ninth Doctor and Rose, and three are set in the gap between Doctor Dances and Boomtown. I've already read the original three novels, so I wanted to go for one that I haven't read yet, uh, which would be the second three with uh, Captain Jack. Mm -hmm. And of those three, I decided to go with uh, Only Human by Gareth Roberts. Um, It should be hopefully more widely available than some of the other Ninth Doctor titles because it was uh, also chosen as a reprint in the 50th. And there's also an audio version available uh, read by Anthony Head, uh, Giles from Buffy. So if you want to experience it that way, that's an option too. Yes. I've enjoyed Gareth Roberts' take on the fourth Doctor in Romana. So Mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see how he captures uh, Jack, Rose, and the Doctor together. Mm -hmm. Yes, it'll be good. Uh, I hope. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) uh, I've only read one Knife Doctor book and uh, yeah. Uh, so uh so yeah we'll, we'll see i'm not as much of a fan as you are of um, of gareth roberts fourth doctor books um mm. but uh we'll we'll see we'll see sounds good well until next month i've been matt in minnesota chris in south london happy reading for listening to the all-new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast special thanks to george c music for use of their song doctor who theme swing jazz version you can follow us on twitter at andwbc podcast and like us on facebook you can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on itunes you can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to andwbc podcast at gmail.com and until next month happy reading The race went ahead, so the twenty miles along the um, the banks of the Thames today. So it was, oh wow, uh, yeah, that was nice. Uh, but tired. <laughs> going from Putney to Richmond, areas that you probably haven't heard of. So uh, Putney is where uh, H. G. Wells sets the last bit of um, War of the Worlds, as it's where uh, the Martians catch the virus and die. Mm. So claim to fame. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, so was that. Is this the race you've been training for? No, it's part of the training for the race that oh. I'm training for. <laughs> so it's it's only six and a bit miles off the marathon, which oh. is what I am training for, which will take me down to Brighton uh, next month. And I'll probably not be recreating uh, K9 scenes on the beach in the Leisure Hive. <laughs> um, <laughs> hopefully not. I haven't totally decided whether I'm going to go for the audio version or not. Mm. I mean, whilst it will uh, it will help me to do the audio, I just kind of having had a couple of not so much kind of like near misses with cars. I go like, ah, I'm happy to be just running around and and if I have stuff on, not stuff that I have to concentrate because <laughs> <laughs> um, I could be reviewing it. Yeah, you have to definitely be aware of your surroundings. With there is a kind of a bigish park, but it's a bit of a driveway. Yeah, so what I'm kind of mainly doing is kind of road stuff. But so, but anyway, we are not a running podcast. There are many running podcasts. <laughs>